It is my pleasure to be introducing our keynote speaker today, Dr. Paul D. Thompson. Dr. Thompson is Chief of Cardiology at Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, and Physician Co-Director of the Hartford Healthcare Heart and Vascular Institute. He is Professor of Medicine at the University of Connecticut. His educational background includes degrees from Tufts College and Tufts Medical School. He served as a medical intern and resident, as well as cardiology catheterization fellow at Tufts New England Medical Center and completed his training in cardiology at Stanford Medical Center. He has authored over 450 scientific articles on topics which include the effects of exercise training on preventing and treating heart disease, the cardiovascular risks of vigorous exercise, the effects of exercise on lipid metabolism, the effects of statins on skeletal muscle, and genetic factors affecting the exercise response. The NIH has supported several of these projects. Dr. Thompson is the co-editor of the 40-chapter book, Exercise and Sports Cardiology. He is a past president of the American College of Sports Medicine. Dr. Thompson's research and clinical interests in exercise originate from his personal interest in distance running. He qualified for the 1972 U.S. Olympic Marathon Trials and finished 16th in the Boston Marathon in 1976. Dr. Thompson has served as a television medical commentator for two Boston and five New York City marathons and commented on the 1992 and 1993 New York City events while running the race. He was NBC's sports medicine analyst at the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea, and served in a similar capacity for ABC's coverage of the 1991 Pan American Games in Cuba. It is an honor to welcome Dr. Paul Thompson to the podium today to speak about screening across the continuum. Thank you very much. Now, here's my first piece of advice to you. Always get your mother to write your CV. That's the way to do it. So great to be here. I appreciate Sam inviting me. I enjoyed the first two talks. I thought they were very good. I think you're very lucky to have such speakers. And also, I'd like to say hello to Paul Visich, who was a researcher with me years ago um, when we had an NIH um, grant looking at uh, how genes affected skeletal muscle hypertrophy. So I'm going to talk about screening uh, lives, cardiac screening plus. These are my financial disclosures so that if anybody makes a lipid lowering agent, I have probably consulted for them or lectured for them or whatever because of our interest of how statins affect skeletal muscle. So here's the question. Does screening athletes with an electrocardiogram save lives? You hear a lot about this, and there are a lot of companies that will offer screening for you, et cetera. Does it save lives? Well, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because there are no randomized controlled clinical trials. That's how you prove things. Um, I don't think so. And in fact, I've always thought that ECG screening may actually cost lives. Why? Because if you find abnormalities, you get sent to cardiologists. I'm a cardiologist, and we do things. <laughs> now, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I want to give you the arguments on both sides. So, does ECG screening uh, with an ECG save lives? Here's, I don't know why it came back. Um, I do think it's an excellent business strategy. I think it's an excellent business strategy if I'm running a cardiology practice. Um, and that's because of what we call downstream testing. So, if I see you as an athlete and I do an electrocardiogram on you and it's slightly abnormal, then I have a reason to go ahead and do an echocardiogram and a stress test and other things. And the way I, as a cardiologist, make my money is not by seeing patients. It's by testing patients. Because I can see a patient and maybe get a bill $180 for that consult, which may take me 30 minutes. I'm lucky to get 60% of that reimbursed. But if I send you for a stress test and I happen to own the stress test machine, I get not only the reading of that stress test, but I get what's called the institutional fee. If I own the echo machine, I not only get to read it, but I get to get the institutional fee for that machine. You get it? That's the business strategy. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about exercise-related sudden cardiac death. And some of this will be a stretch for some of you because I'll talk about some conditions you haven't heard before, but I'll try to explain them as we go. How frequent is exercise-related sudden cardiac death? 
what is the evidence that ECG screening of athletes does or does not work? And what probably does work? What should you be doing in your practices or in your schools or wherever you're involved? So let's start with what causes exercise-related sudden death. And you really have to define that into what causes exercise sudden death in the young or in adults. Now, this is kind of wrong because I really think that this thing about what the young should be age 71 and under. Um, but <laughs> we won't deal with that. So um, here's uh, exercise-related sudden death in adults. And this is from a paper in 2015 in circulation. I hope you can see that. And does this, did the pointer come up? The pointer does not come up on the screen, I guess, because I'm pointing to it on here, but I guess, okay, I'm sorry about that. Keep going to the right. Keep going to the right. There it is. Oh, you can is see it? it on there, but not here. Oh, okay. Um, so here's, uh, this is a paper in 2015. So let's look at those people who had sports-related or had non-sports-related deaths. And if you do that, sort of, be dumb about this, but what happened to it? What happened to that pointer? Aha, uh -huh. happened to him too. There it is. You can also, you can so also it's use this only too. on the, yeah, I know I can. It's just, you can use that. I thought, good. So we'll use this. So if you look at sports related, uh, there were 63 in non sports related deaths. And what I want you to emphasize, what I want you to see primarily is that there are a fair number of people that are, have unexplained causes. But in these middle-aged individuals, coronary artery disease and non-acute uh, coronary artery disease and non-acute coronary artery disease, so the red, the red, um, whatever color that is, whatever, is a primary cause of death, so narrowing of the coronary arteries. Now, what's the difference between an acute coronary syndrome and a non-acute coronary syndrome? A non-acute coronary syndrome is basically that the artery is narrowed over time and there's no clot there. You see, um, when the thing that causes most myocardial infarctions, causes most myocardial infarctions, is not a tight narrowing. It's not a tight narrowing in the artery. Why? Well, I drove here from Connecticut, so I came up Route 84. Suppose that I heard that there was a tractor trailer truck that turned over on Route 84. Am I late? Nope. Why am I late? is I take a collateral artery around that tractor trailer truck. But if a tractor trailer truck turns over right in front of me and I've just gone by the last exit, I'm stuck. Then I will get in trouble. So what happens with most myocardial infarctions, about 70 of them, heart attacks, is that you go from having thickening of the coronary artery with no blockage until where you get a rip in that, that plaque. We call it the crack in the plaque. You get a crack in the cholesterol plaque what do you do if you cut your epithelium? If you cut your epithelium, shaving. Now, I know a lot of you ladies don't shave, at least yet. But if you cut yourself shaving, if you cut yourself shaving, right, you bleed, you clot. That's what happens to your epithelium. What happens to your endothelium? You get a crack in that, you bleed and you clot. And unfortunately, if that clot happens to occur in your coronary artery, and you haven't had the time to develop collateralization, you get a heart attack because there's no blood flow. That's in contrast to non-acute coronary disease, which is the narrowing of the artery over time. The narrowing of the artery over time can result in a very tight lesion that has a little bit of a hole through there. And when you exercise, you induce cardiac ischemia, not enough oxygen, that can cause an arrhythmia. But the point is, Coronary artery disease is responsible for most deaths, not all, most deaths in adults. What about young individuals? This is a, a report that Barry Marin and I did in um, 2007, and we looked at causes of sudden death in those individuals age 40 and under. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the biggest cause. Now, what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's just what it says. Hyper means too much. Trophic means growth. Too much growth. Cardio means heart, myopathy means muscle. Too much growth of the heart and muscle. So these are individuals who have a genetic defect that leads to a very thick myocardium. That thick myocardium can cause arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. But then there are other abnormalities. There's these coronary artery anomalies, there's myocarditis, there's this congenital thing called the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And there's the other usual list of suspects. That's what we always thought. We always thought it was predominantly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
Let's look at some of these other things. This is, these are called anomalous coronary arteries. So here is the pulmonary artery, PA, pulmonary artery. It sits in, this is the anterior chest wall out here. So the pulmonary artery sits in front of the aorta. And out come your coronary arteries, they come out and they branch, and they should come out straight. They should come out straight. Now some kids are born with an anomalous coronary artery. So the coronary artery comes out and it takes that very tight turn and then it gives off. Now what can happen is one thing can happen is that that can get compressed. That artery can get compressed. As stroke volume increases during exercise, it can get compressed. But also look at this. Look at the angle that that comes off. So if the stroke volume increases and the aorta gets bigger, it can compress that. It can't compress it here because it's a straight shot, but here it can compress it. And here's an example where somebody increased their stroke volume during exercise, and you can see this anomalous angle, this atypical angle, now closes that artery. Deal? So that's what we think happens with those things. Here's a 17-year-old kid who died during a basketball, and you can see that the right coronary artery is up here. It's actually embedded, embedded in the wall. It's embedded in the wall. So as the aorta enlarges during exercise, the stroke volume goes up, that artery can be compressed and closed. This is right ventricular cardiomyopathy in a report that we um, published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology way back in 2001. But right ventricular cardiomyopathy is very interesting. And here's why it's interesting. The thing that keeps myocytes together are these things called the desmosomes. For your heart to contract, everything has got to work together, right? And so the desmosomes are right here and they combine the myocytes together, right? So that they can contract. Some people are born with defects in these desmosomal proteins. So if the heart gets enlarged during exercise training, right? Or when you're exercise, it can tear at those junctions. This condition is important for cardiologists like myself to know because it has been shown that these people actually do worse with exercise. If you exercise train them, they're more likely to die early. If you're a varsity athlete, you're more likely to show up to the cardiologist if you have these genes. It's the first example of that where we have where exercise is actually deleterious to people who picked the wrong parents. Um, I'm going to skip this, but this just goes to show what it looks like, um, why, how, you can pick, how you can pick it up on electrocardiogram, how you can pick it up on electrocardiogram, and it has this little funny wave here. Now, that's very hard for someone to see and very hard to pick up. But the question is, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy really the most common cause? Here's a study of sudden death in sports in the United Kingdom by uh, uh, Sanjay Sharma. Um, who was the director of the London Marathon in the Olympics. Uh, it's the, there were all these 347 deaths were referred to this CRI, which is cardiovascular risk in the young autopsy center. And what they found is that sudden arrhythmic death syndrome was responsible for 42% of the deaths. Now, what is sudden arrhythmic death syndrome? They died, we don't know why. The heart's normal. We died and we don't know why. So they probably had ventricular fibrillation can't prove it, but there's nothing wrong with the heart. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, these people are all referred. So if you could figure out that they had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or a coronary artery anomaly, you wouldn't have referred them, would you? Because you knew what they had. So I'm not sure you can use that data, but there's new data that um, two other studies I'm going to show you here. And this is the cause of um, death in National Collegiate Athletic Association athletes. And it's a bunch of um, NCAA athletes who died over a 10-year period, sudden cardiac death, and about 80 of them. Now, remember, 80 over 10 years is 8 a year in the whole NCAA program. Uh, 64 had autopsies. There was no explanation in a bunch of them, coronary artery anomalies, and a few myocarditis, coronary artery disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was way down the list, and then left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, remember, left ventricular hypertrophy may simply be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but not so bad that it's obvious. But the question is, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy really the cause? So let's ask the next question, which is, um, so what causes exercise-related sudden death? In adults, it's primary coronary artery disease. In younger individuals, 
We used to always say it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now we're saying we're not so darn certain. So what, how frequent is exercise-related sudden cardiac death? Well, we really don't know. No, we really don't know why, because there's no comprehensive national death registry. You understand sudden death is not common. And so if you have a big population and an uncommon numerator, the number of people who died, all you need is a one or two deaths to go either way, and you change the number a whole lot. So you got to have a lot of deaths, and you got to have a big numerator and a big denominator in order to figure it out accurately. Here's our study of sudden death um, in the state of Rhode Island. Now, this was published way back in 1982. I'm not using it just because I'm an egomaniac. I'm using it because there aren't a lot of studies that have looked at this problem more recently. I'm going to, uh, so this is one of the more frequently cited studies. But what we did is I, um, uh, it took me, when I came to Brown years ago, 1978, I think it was, it took me about a week to figure out there was only one medical examiner. <laughs> There's only one medical examiner, and that dude's willing to collect everybody who drops dead during exercise. We're going to have ourselves a study. So we collected, we collected everybody who dropped dead jogging over a six-year period. And I had these women who called, uh, who, did, who used, did a random digit telephone survey. So we had a computer that would generate a number, and these women would call the number between 5 and 7 in the evening, and they spoke all the common Rhode Island languages and they would ask if the person was a jogger and how much they jogged. So you probably want to know what the common Rhode Island languages are. So they're English, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and profane. Because there are a lot of people who do not like to be called between 5 and 7 in the evening, right? Because it's right. So, you know, we get some great tapes. They're great to listen at. But um, what we found is that um, the death rate was actually... Uh, pretty low. Now, you were more likely to die during jogging than at other times. Your death rate definitely goes up during exercise. So why is that? So here's your heart, right? And you get these arteries sitting on it. They're called what? They're called the coronary arteries. Why are they called coronary arteries? Because they crown the heart. They're a coronation artery. Every time your heart beats, those coronary arteries have to twist and turn, don't they? So suppose they've got atherosclerosis in it. Atherosclerosis. Athro. Sclerosis. Sclerosis means hardening. Athro means artery. So if you've got hardening of your arteries and those things are being flexed by exercise, right? They're likely to get a crack in the coronary plaque. You get the crack, you form the clot, et cetera, et cetera. It's like a rubber hose that's been left out in the sun and you start bending it, right, to roll it up or something. You crack the thing. Those of you who remember rubber hoses. Um, so uh, we found that you were seven times more likely to die during exercise. But the other important thing is that if you didn't have coronary disease, your death rate per year was actually pretty low. No women. Whoa, you sexist. No women. Women do have a very low rate of sudden death during exercise. And we, uh, there are reasons I can explain that, but it's a very low rate. So what we found was one death per year in every 15,000 healthy dudes and what David Siskovic found in Seattle two years later was one death in every 18,000 dudes. So if you take healthy people, the death rate during exercise is quite low among adult men. We think it's actually lower now. Why do we think that? Because of statins, because of better preventive me methods, but we don't know for sure. Now, suppose you look at high school athletes. This is from Steve Van Camp way back in 1995. What he found was that the death rate was about one death in every 133,000 men and about 800,000 women. Remember, women have low rates of sudden death during exercise. It seems to be higher in college athletes than in, um, in high school athletes. So let me tell you what I think is going on. As your heart gets bigger, it's more likely to fibrillate. Big hearts fibrillate more easily. They go into cardiac arrest more easily. So we've often wondered if the smaller hearts in women and the smaller hearts in younger versus older people is one of the contributors. Now, that I said we've often thought, okay? Nobody knows that for sure. Um, if you look at uh, a review by Christine Laura Lawless um, in, in Jack, she says that the sudden cardiac death rate in the United States is about one in every 200,000 high school and college athletes, and it's fairly constant in most studies. 
Um, there was one study at the same issue that had four sudden cardiac deaths in 19 years in the state of Minnesota, um, Minnesota high school athletes. And that was one death for every 416,000 um, over 19 years. And the death rate seems to be lower more recently. So one death in almost a million athletes. So that means that it's a pretty rare event, right? But now let me show you some other side of that. Um, oh, sorry. So this is sudden cardiac arrest during participation in competitive sports from the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is a registry from Ontario, Canada, these years, 2009, 2015, in individuals less than age 45, uh, during or one hour after sport. That's usually the definition. You define sudden death during exercise as actually during exercise or within, uh, within, uh, within one hour. Um, it was in, this area is about 6.6 .6 million people. And what they found is that there were only 74 cardiac arrests during uh, sports in uh, 18.5 million person years. 16 of them happened during competition. More happened during non-competition, during um, uh, recreational sports. That was an incidence of 0.76 per 100,000 or one death per every 131,000 competitors. And what is the point I'm trying to make? I'm trying to make the fact that the, the, this, this looks very rare. And if it's very rare, you're going to be doing a lot of ECG screening. You're going to be a lot, doing a lot of screening in general to save anybody. 43% um, survived, and that's what they had. Um, very few of them. I, this, I don't know what happened to that, but it's approximately three could have been saved by screening. So a very small number could have been saved by screening. Um, and 10 over 16 had a cause identified. And I'm going to show you the other side of it. So here's Kim Harmon. And she studies uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association deaths and is a big advocate that nobody should participate in anything without an ECG. Big advocate. So they looked at cardiovascular sudden deaths in the NCAA, and what they found was that the, uh, cardiac disease was responsible for 56% of those deaths, and they got a death rate of one in every 43,000. And if you looked at National Collegiate Athletic Association basketball players, there was one death in every 3,100 per year. That means if you go to four years of college, four years, right, you get one chance in 800 of having a sudden cardiac death if you play NCAA basketball. So, you know, that's a, a scary number. Now, let me give you one more scary number. And this comes, uh, sorry. Um, let me skip that. So this is just published just this month, uh, August 2018. And it's again from my friend Sanjay Sharma in London. They did a questionnaire, physical examination, an ECG, and echo on about 12, uh, 11,000 males. The mean age was 16.4. These were all soccer players who were good enough to having been attached to one of the teams in Great Britain. So these are good soccer players. They're not the run of the mill, and they're all males. They found 42 sudden cardiac uh, disorders, sudden cardiac death from cardiac disorders. Uh, 23 of the deaths, eight were sudden cardiac deaths. Seven of these eight were from cardiomyopathy. Six of eight had a normal screen and the average time to death was 6.8 years. So they got one death for every 14,000 athletes per year. So if it's one in 200,000, it's a real problem to find them. If it's one in 14,000, or what Chris, uh, or what the, the folks from Seattle say, one death in every 3,000, then that's a different deal. So what's the problem? It may actually be that the death rates are higher among these highly trained athletes, right? Now we talked about right ventricular cardiomyopathy, but there may be other genetic conditions that are actually worsened. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Um, and so why such high rates in young athletes, in some of these young athletes, the NCAA basketball players and the, uh, the British soccer players? Now, one possibility is that the data is wrong, right? But the other possibility is there may actually be deleterious effects from very prolonged, intense exercise training, like what you have to do to make it in the NCAA as a basketball player, or what you need to do to be, uh, to be picked by a British soccer team. 
and we've looked at this in this review, are the deleterious cardiac effects of acute and chronic endurance exercise. There's a bunch of increasing evidence that, that, for example, with right ventricular cardiomyopathy, that you actually make those people worse if you exercise training. So one of the areas we may be going in the future is not whether exercise is good for you. Everybody knows that exercise is good for you. But what if you get way out on the far end of the curve and you're doing tons of exercise? Now, a lot of exercise people go nuts when I say this. I'm not saying we know. I'm saying we need to start thinking about it because we have these high death rates in fairly high level young athletes. Okay, what's the evidence that EC screening does or does not work? So this is the primary study. It's by Dominic Corredo. It was published in JAMA. I reviewed it, I accepted it. A lot of people are angry at me because I did. So here's what they found. Here are the unscreened at people over this uh, 26 year period. Here's what happened in sudden death in the athletes. Now, right in here, they started screening. They started doing ECG screening on everybody in the Padua area of Italy before they participated in exercise. My gosh, the deaths almost went away, right? So that really looks like screening worked. So um, both the American Heart Association and the European Union recommend cardiac screening, but the Europeans recommend that you do an ECG. We recommend that you do this 14 question thing and you examine the athlete, but not everybody gets an ECG, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, so he, Corrado reported this decrease in one death per 27,000 athletes per year to one death in every 250,000 athletes, you know, almost a tenfold reduction. It was primarily due to finding cardiomyopathy in our erogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Um, and 9% needed more tests. I told you about that. That's generally the number. Somewhere between 5 and 10% of people are going to require additional testing. That's why I think screening is a great business strategy. And only 2% of athletes were excluded. But that means 1 in 50 kids is told, eh, can't play, something's the matter with you. Right, but we don't have 1 in 50 kids dying. Nobody argues that. So the point is, when you do a lot of ECG screening, you're going to wind up restricting a fair number of athletes. Now, Ben Levine and I wrote the editorial that went along with this, and this is what we said. But look, that sounds convincing, but it's an observational study. Um, they're different populations. They're athletes and they're non-athletes. There was no direct comparison, yay, nay, of an ECG and not an ECG. You either got screened with an ECG or you got nothing. It's not the same. Um, other things change. For example, that disease I talked about, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy was described during that tracing, during that, uh, that time, during that tracing that went down. So maybe what happened in Italy is they started recognizing that disease and they pulled those kids out of exercise. Um, Italy is not the United States. Different diseases, different doctors. What do I mean by that? In Italy, they've trained a lot of physicians. They have an excess of physicians. So they have a lot of people that can do that screening. You know, we're short of physicians. So if we take and assign a physician to do screening at every high school in the United States with all the follow-up, it's really gonna be a demand on manpower. Um, their best rate is our present rate, right? Their rate now is one death in every 250,000. I've shown you that when you look generally at the United States, it's one death in about 200,000, so they're about the same. And finally, are asymptomatic folks the same as symptomatic? What do I mean by that? If a kid comes in to see me who's passed out and I find hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I am worried. On the other hand, if we find hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with no symptoms, is that the same? It's not the same. Symptoms are different. So what you find on screening is different from what you find from symptoms. And we'll come back to that. So Barry Marin and I, um, uh, Barry Marin's one of the greats in this whole field of sudden cardiac death. What we did is we compared what was happening in Minnesota with what was happening in, um, in the, the Veneto area of Italy. So here's Minnesota. They're about the same size. They got about the same population. And here's what happened in Minnesota. Here's the death rate in Minnesota over the years. Here's that graph I showed you for Italy. And what you can see is that we're not that different. We've not been that different all along. So for some reason, our rate is like their best rate. Um, there's also this study from Israel. Israel decided to require that every athlete needed screening. 
Now, why did Israel decide every athlete needed screening? Because there was a bump in the number of deaths during athletics. So this is what happened. There was this big increase in sudden death during exercise um, in Israel. So what did they do? They got all upset and they passed a law that everybody had to be screened. And so the death rate came down. But if you look at these 10 years versus these 10 years, there's no difference. So the screening didn't make a difference. This bump prompted people to start screening. And then they said, oh, look what happened. We saved all these lives. But not if you go back and you count what happened beforehand. Um, so they thought that mandatory ECG screening had no hepatic effect. So what's the risks? Okay, what's the problem with screening these kids? Well, one of them is you get a lot of false positive results, and I'll show you why in a minute. It's what I call diagnostic creep. So here's what happens. They get an abnormal ECG, they do an echo. The echo's a little abnormal, so I'm going to get a cardiac MR. The, um, the cardiac MR is a little abnormal. Before you know it, you took an abnormal ECG and you've crept all the way to some bad disease. I see these kids from all over the country and I frequently have to say, look, you're healthy, right? But it's hard to get it out of the kid's mind that there's something the matter with them. There are costs, there are costs. Now you say to me, wait a minute, the kid's got insurance. Yeah, but have you ever seen the deductibles on some of these insurance plans? And who's likely to get these screenings in college? Uh, you know, oftentimes they turn out to be African-American athletes who don't necessarily have the best deductible procedure. You know, and I, I can tell you about some Ivy League schools that have run into this problem. And the athletic department wound up uh, having to foot the bill. There's also, there's also um, patient parental anxiety, which is sometimes persistent. Once you get it into the family's head that something could be wrong, it's hard to get rid of it. It's, uh, it's not quite so easy. Um, there's, then there's also the thing about unnecessary restriction and what I call medical misadventurism. Medical misadventurism. I'm a cardiologist. I love doing things like love putting in pacemakers. No more fun than doing a cardiac cath anywhere in the world. But unfortunately, I see kids sent to me with pacemakers they didn't need, defibrillators they didn't need. Um, they undergo cardiac ablations, they undergo stuff. So um, there are potential problems. Why are there potential problems? Because there are a lot of abnormalities out there, but we don't think there are all that many deaths, right? So the key problem with screening is that athletes are different. They really are different. Um, here's a kid I saw that was an, a, a 28 year old, 217 Irish marathoner. You look at these, this EKG and that is a scary EKG. I see people after somebody drops dead during exercise. Somebody drops dead during exercise and all of them start coming in, right? So this kid had a little momentary chest discomfort. And a rule of thumb is momentary chest discomfort. Seconds of chest discomfort is almost nothing, is, is almost never anything. Momentary chest discomfort. Got, this, got the ECG done, right? So he goes from having chest discomfort that it's nothing. It was momentary, bing, bing, bing. Gets an EKG, it's abnormal. Right, so now you've entered diagnostic creep. Well, this kid's been great for the last uh, 20 years. Here's a 16 year old Myler that I saw in 1970 when I worked in David Costell's lab as a medical student. What was I doing in David Costell's lab? I was running 10 miles every day and getting my leg biopsy. It was, you know, it was awful. Uh, seven holes, seven holes in my quadriceps with Dave Costell. But this was a kid who has um, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome a real Parkinson white conduction. Now this is a problem because WPW can cause sudden death during exercise. What's the problem? The problem is that athletes show WPW more than other people. Why? WPW is caused by two conducting systems. You have your normal AD node and in WPW you have this bundle that comes around. What happens with exercise training? You increase vagal tone. Increasing vagal tone blocks the normal conduction so you can see that accessory pathway. So WPW is more common in athletes. And there are plenty of cardiologists out there that are glad to ablate that for you. But unfortunately, sometimes the ablation leads to heart block, the necessity of a pacemaker and other things. So you have to be judicious. WPW is more common in endurance athletes. And this goes to show that when he exercises, it goes away and it comes back every other beat. So it's a safe pathway. It's a safe pathway. 
Um, but the point is you can find it more commonly in athletes. The QT interval, we all have heard of long QT syndrome, which can cause sudden death. QTs are longer in athletes. Why are they longer in athletes? Because they have slower heart rates. If they have a slower heart rate, they have a longer QT, all of a sudden you get diagnosed with long QT syndrome. Here's um, Italian, uh, uh, Antonio Pelliccia. He's the, um, the cardiologist who runs the Italian Olympic team. Here are his two kids. And here's my kid, that's, uh, that's Rascal, one of our pugs. Um, there's a 1971 Italian law that requires medical screening of athletes. They have to have a history, ECG, step test. If necessary, they get a 24-hour ECG, an echo, and a stress test. So what this has done, it, the, Italy, the Italians screen everybody, and they screen your heart. But what it's really done is it's given us good data. So let me show you some of that. If you look at national collegiate athletes, almost a third of them have abnormal EKGs. Ching, 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 ching. Did you hear the cash register run? Okay. They get global cardiac enlargement, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle. Everything looks big. It's mild. If they have marked enlargement, it's disease. Here's, um, I'll just blow through this, but this is a fairly famous um, exercise epidemiologist who gave me his EKGs. Look, he started running in 1967, and here he is in 1989. Look what happened. His atria got bigger over time. His um, right bundle started to develop a right bundle branch block. See it here all the way over there? His T waves got ooh, pretty ugly looking. So the point is, is that with exercise training, you change the electrocardiogram. It looks bad. The cavity gets bigger. In these Italian athletes, 45% of them had abnormally enlarged left ventricles. 55 is the upper limits of normal. In women, um, it was much less, but they had some pretty big ventricles as well. Um, and then they can also have abnormal wall thickness. We think the wall should be up to 11 in normal, but here you can see these athletes, these male athletes out here with thickened walls. If the wall is abnormally thickened, you may be tempted to say that they've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then you're off to the races, diagnostic creep. And here's the left atrium from, this is one of Antonio's slides, but 20% of them are larger than normal. Now these are elite, athletes, okay? These are, really, these are not your run-of-the-mill athletes, and that's something I always evaluate when I see an athlete. They say to me, I'm an athlete. Well, what do you do? I run three miles every day. I don't tell them they're not an athlete, okay? Um, so if you look at the electrocardiographic criteria for cardiac abnormalities, um, African Americans tend to have more abnormalities. This is the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, this was an older model that we use. This is the Seattle criteria. This is what's called the refined. Now this is thought to be the best approach, the best measurement of the ECG. So these are experts, cardiology experts from, uh, you know, Sanjay Sharma's group in London. They're reading EKGs on, on, on black athletes and on white athletes. 11% of the blacks, 5% of the whites have abnormal EKGs. That means they need additional testing. Hey, 5% is not so bad. We can deal with that. The problem is, is that um, who reads the EKGs? In expert hands, it's 5%. But experts don't read the EKGs. The computers read the EKGs. The computer reads the EKG. And if that computer says it's abnormal, you're going to have to do something about it. It's very hard to override that. And remember, I love advanced practice nurse practitioners. I love primary care doctors, but they're not expert cardiologists interested in the ECGs of athletes. So when you actually do it in the real world, there are a lot of false positives. So what probably works? I think paying attention to symptoms works. Don't evaluate people unless they have problems. And universal CPR, let me show you the data. Here's one of our papers from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, Aaron Bagish was the lead author. They used the techniques that we used when I did that um, Rhode Island study years ago. Cardiac arrests over 10 years in marathons and half marathons. Higher in men than women, we've learned that. It's, un it's unfair, but um, so it is. Bystander CPR and non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy predicted survival. If someone uh, gave you CPR, you had a better chance of surviving. If you look at sudden death in middle age, that study I told you about before, 
Number one is that it's a public occurrence. Sports associated sudden cardiac death, 90% of them occur in public. Well, if they occur in public, someone can do something to resuscitate them. Ventricular fibrillation, you know, when the heart doesn't go gush, gush, it goes quiver, 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 84% of the time. Ventricular fibrillation is easily cardioverted with an electric, you know, an automated electric defibrillator. 16% had known disease in this middle age thing, but look at 36% of them had prior symptoms. You go and speak to their spouses. When we did that in Rhode Island, 50% of our subjects had complained to their spouses of heartburn. They don't call it heartburn for nothing, right? Um, so, you know, there, a lot of them had symptoms that they complained about. So we really think that paying attention to symptoms works, and we think paying attention to CPR. So keep up your CPR training. You know, if you deal with athletes or you're in your exercise areas, it's probably one of the things that you can do that really, really, really makes a difference. So saving athletes' lives, cardiac screening. Yeah, we do believe in cardiac screening. We just don't believe in it being an extensive cardiac screening that requires ECGs, et cetera. I think they should see a physician. They should be examined to make sure you don't see the major things. Um, and then you should evaluate symptoms. And you should make sure that the athletic facilities you're associated with, um, that everybody there knows how to do CPR, that you have a defibrillator whose battery is charged, that it's not locked away, and that you have a plan. If someone collapses in this room today, do you know what to do? If someone collapses in your gym on Monday, do you have a plan? Do you know who's going to call a 911? Do you know those things? We think that would be the more to save lives. And not only would it save athletes' lives, but it would save other people's lives as well. Look, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I hope the talk was useful. I know I didn't give you absolute conclusions as to whether ECG screening saves lives. I gave him my bias. Um, but it's really my honor to be on a program with such good other speakers. Thank you. So now it's your chance to ask questions, and I'll make up the, I'll give you answers. What do you want to talk about? So what are the symptoms in young, young athletes? Yeah, so the question is, what are the symptoms in young athletes? They're the same thing that you get in symptoms in older athletes. For example, unexplained dyspnea, unexplained shortness of breath, inability to keep up with your peers, chest discomforts, passing out, uh, you know, feeling faint during exercise, those sorts of things. Now, with things such as the anomalous coronary artery, it can present early, but we think it tends to present in um, when going through the growth spurt in puberty, because we think what happens is that the heart starts to enlarge to the point where it outstrips the coronary artery's ability to supply. But you know what? Uh, anybody that's got an adult or a child that has discomfort from the earlobe to the belly button, uh, you know, should should be seen at some point by a cardiologist. And one of my big rules for for internists is that every GI workup starts in the stress lab. Why? What's the top of the stomach called? The cardium. Why is it called the cardium? Because when you're an embryo and you're all curled up like that, uh, you know, the dermatome five, six, seven, a lot of the dermatomes that contribute to the heart, especially, you know, uh, cervical five, as you stretch out, that becomes your shoulder, your jaw, your chest, your heart, the top of your stomach. So, you know, a lot of pain that's referred to the to, that people tell you they got, uh, you know, they got gastritis or something, can be a sign of, uh, of ischemia, especially if it comes on with exercise and goes away with rest. What was the first EKG in the I don't think an ECG is indicated. So I, I think I misled you. No, no. I, I, when it, I mean, so, so the question was, when should they get an ECG? He's got two 15-year-old boys, and they haven't had an ECG. In terms of athletes, we don't think it's necessary. I don't know what the American Society of Pediatrics recommends. I don't think they recommend routine ECGs. Um, but we're talking primarily here about athletes. And you know, my kids have never had, my boys who played sports, hockey and, and other things, um, they were, I, you know, in fact, I said, I prefer you not do an ECG because then you're off to the races. Once you get it on paper, it's hard to ignore. Other questions? Paul. So Paul Visich and I were involved in two very interesting genetic studies back in the um, back when I had some hair. It's a long time ago. Yeah. 
So it's a great question. Atrial fibrillation is where the atrium, which should go squeeze, squeeze, quivers. And it's a very common condition, and it's a worrisome condition, because when the atrium quivers and doesn't contract, blood can clot. And then the blood can move out of there and give you a stroke. And what's the rule? One stroke will ruin your whole day if it's yours, right? So you really don't want to let people have strokes. That's why you see all these compounds recommended on TV for, for blood thinning. The story with atrial fibrillation, and we've written on this, Paul, um, if you want to look it up, we had an editorial on it in Jack, but it looks like this. So here's the risk of atrial fibrillation, and here's physical activity. Physical activity, risk of atrial fibrillation. The more active you get, it comes down, and then it turns up. So we think what happens is that when you do a lot of exercise training for a long period of time, your atrial fibrillation risk goes up. And that's shown by a bunch of studies. Let me quote one. The Vassalopet is a cross-country skiing race in Sweden, 54 uh, miles of cross-country skiing. If you, they went back and they looked at men who had participated in that race for the Swedish registry, the men who had participated in the most races had the most atrial fibrillation. The fastest men had the most atrial fibrillation. What's the mechanism? We think it's that left atrial size. Remember when I showed you left, oh, I just got out of it. Remember when I showed you that left atrial size was bigger in endurance athletes? I have a left atrium that's 45 millimeters, right? I'm a small guy. 40 is the upper limits of normal. We think that that big left atrium puts you into atrial fibrillation. We think it's a J-shaped curve. That exercise reduces your risk of atrial fibrillation, but if you get a lot, it starts to curve up. Sir? What was the point of the inflection in that curve? Um, oh, so the question was, what's the inflection of that curve with atrial fibrillation? This, it's not available. That data is not available. In other words, how much and how much is too much is not available because these are different studies in which if like if you if you look at sedentary people, they seem to benefit from an exercise program in terms of reducing their risk of atrial fibrillation. Please. So what sensor are you looking at what you were talking about before in the presentation that there is an excellent dose response, not only in how much you're exercising, but also the so I'm going to stop you because we do not have data on intensity versus, we really we have magnitude, right? The, so, for example, these studies are done in uh, guys who ran the Vesalopet. I assume that to run as many miles as they did, or ski as many miles as they did, they had to do some intense training. So we're making that assumption, but we do not know for sure. Go ahead, I'm still with you. after doing a marathon, the hormones that are released are similar to, to after having an MI or not? So they are. So here's, here's the story with that. So way back in um, 1980, Arthur Siegel measured um, uh, the CK levels, right? The CK levels in 15 men running the Boston Marathon. Normal is up to 200. These guys had an average the day after the race of 3,000. Now, that's because CK is also in skeletal muscle. The next year, he measured CKMB, which is in the heart muscle, and that also went up, right? But here's the trick. When you get into shape, your muscle becomes, your skeletal muscle becomes more heart-like. So we thought that what was going on is that they got injury to their skeletal muscle that released CKMB. Then along come more sensitive measurements, the troponins, and the troponins go up. The the troponin, troponin I is, sent, is specific for the heart, and it appears to go up after exercise. So we think that there may actually be some myocardial effects from prolonged distance running like running a marathon. So let me tell you what's available now, and it's in that paper that we summarized. One is that there's evidence that tons of exercise can lead to increased coronary calcification. When you exercise, um, when you get atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries, you also put down calcium. We, we and others have shown that people who are in their 60s and have been lifelong athletes seem to have more coronary calcification than you expect. 
It's also been shown that there's fibrosis in people who are lifelong athletes. Now, and only about 20% of them, but there's unexplained fibrosis. So the only thing I'm talking to you about is that this is an area of active research. Exercise is good. Our problem in the United States is not over-exercise. So, so don't get me wrong. But it's interesting, there does seem to be that on the fair, on the far right hand of that curve, there seems to be an increase in, 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 in issues, in issues. Next, done? No, 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 no. any online oh. questions? Any, any? So I'm let's supposed see. to hit that. Um, I'm going to see if question, let's see if we can see it here. It says here, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you better come up here. I don't think we just want to. I'm not sure. Any I'm other sure. in-person questions? I think grandkids have a question. Yeah, go ahead. OK, so it says. Um, does WPW and long QT that present due to athletic training present any increased risk of the athlete during training or competition? We don't think so. We think that the WPW is just unveiling the fact that it's there. We think the long QT um, is not an issue as well. But you know, nobody really knows. Uh, nobody knows these things. So I would say probably not. Do you recommend screening of young athletes years later if the athlete was diagnosed with a cardiac issue? Yes. If a kid has a cardiac issue, at any time, they should be seen periodically to make sure. Um, the boy had syncopal episodes at 10 years old and playing soccer and was instructed by MI to stop playing soccer. And the boy has consequently limited his activity. Is it possible that a reassessment could indicate that years later there's no longer a need? Yeah, I think we were very conservative years ago. And I think we're less conservative now. There are a lot of athletes that I restricted from participation 30 years ago, for example. And now the more we've done this, we've seen that there, there are a lot of people who do very well with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example. So I do think that everybody looks needs a reevaluation occasionally. And the question is, if somebody has had a cardiac condition, yes, they should be evaluated, not just assume that it's the same. You know, the knowledge in this field in, in, in medicine is general, general is changing all the time. 